thank you very much. Uh, Lachlan Klein, Mayor of the City of Hunley. I I'm just wondering, uh, what possible reforms do you see for local government? Um, I think, um, I mean, there are a number of uh, existing uh, reform processes that are currently underway which have got important relevance for local government. There's the um, planning reforms, um, and that's um, part way underway. I, I favour, and I don't know what will emerge from that process, but I favour um, getting more uh, alignment between uh, the uh, structures that we have in local government and uh, state government regions. You, you remember we at one stage created 12 regions, 12 state government regions, at least for planning purposes, and I don't want this to be taken as a reference to amalgamations, but at least for planning purposes I think there are some powerful reasons why at the very least development assessment could occur on a regional basis so that there's some greater uh, consistency. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm, I have an open mind about uh, structural reform in relation to local government, although I think um, that there are powerful reasons for why local communities should be closely connected, I think, to their local representatives. But I do favour collaboration where there are certain efficiencies to be gained. But I don't think you'll necessarily see us advancing a, a particular structural reform agenda in relation to local government. To the extent that that occurs, it will probably occur in the planning space. But th there are big uh, Commonwealth, state and local government financial relations issues that are thrown up by the federal government. Uh, the federal government has sort of handballed uh, about $5.5 .5 billion problem to us and the temptation is for us to then handball that on to local government, so we're going to have to grapple with that. Um, they're, uh, they're things we'll grapple with in the state budget, but I think they do raise bigger issues of Commonwealth, state, local government relations. Any other questions? Just raise your hand so I... Hello, Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Peter Christopher, Public Service Association. Uh, Premier, I was very pleased to hear your comments about the value you place on the public sector, and that's appreciated. Um, the, the Public Sector Act provides a lot of authority to chief executives and, and creates a mechanism where even on personnel matters, they, they have pretty well authority over their own areas and yet the government has a whole of government agenda, which is often uh, contradictory to uh, the interests of a chief executive required to just focus on managing a department. I'd just be interested on your thoughts as to what government may do to uh, achieve a more whole of government approach to a whole range of matters, including redeployment. Thank you. Well, we are proposing the uh, collective agreements that I mentioned, the, the collective responsibility elements of the Chief Executive Performance Agreements. Uh, we're proposing the performance pay element, which all will hopefully drive uh, those notions of pursuing shared objectives. I mean, there is a tension with somebody being responsible for an agency and trying to run that, and, and then also expecting them to have a responsibility across the, the whole of government. But uh, a strong role for Senior Management Council uh, Senior Management Council, I think, in the past has been more of an information sharing organisation, trying to uh, use it as a more effective strategic um, management body, I think is one of our ambitions. Um, but I don't think there's a structural answer to this. I don't think we're proposing to, to change any of those institutional arrangements around Chief Executive's responsibilities. Uh, but we are going to insist that there's greater collaboration between them. Thank you. Just over there. Thank you. Alan Smith from the State Library. Premier, what would be your top three picks for how you want the public sector to be, to be different by the end of this term of government? Um, well, the first thing is I'd like everybody that worked there to feel very proud of, of working in the public sector, to, to come to work every day and, think, and feel like they are working for a, um, a prestige organisation that they are very proud to work for. That's, that's the first thing. I think many things would cause that, but, but that is how I want people to feel. Um, I'd like there to be... Um, I'd like the public service to feel as though it was um, 
uh, much better connected with the community rather than than being uh, and this is exaggerating make a point but but uh, rather than being experts that hand down solutions to the to a grateful community that there was a much greater integration between what the community saw as the problem and, and were involving them in the design of the solution with the assistance of an expert public service. So rather than being experts handing down solutions, we're experts supplying uh, support to the community who exercise their public judgment about what ought to happen. So that recalibrating our relationship with the community um, and I suppose the third thing is I'd like to see a much a stronger connection, which I have seen in other jurisdictions, between the tertiary sector and the uh, public service. So almost a, you know, an open door between people holding dual appointments at universities and public service and people moving at different times uh, between those two sectors so that there is even greater degrees of collaboration. Don. I do actually think that the academic community in this state can actually contribute quite significantly to the creation of new ideas. In fact, across Australia, I don't actually believe we've really harnessed that collective talent. And I think there's an interesting opportunity there, particularly for many of the wicked problems you face, to actually have diversity of views and to take that in a constructive way. So I'd be very interested in working with you towards a more effective engagement in that space, if that was of your interest. Absolutely. Um, the sort of things I've witnessed and uh, are in other jurisdictions uh, are people holding uh, dual appointments. So they might be a, you know, a deputy chief executive of the Department of Environment. At the same time, they might hold a professorship at the University of Adelaide or, or whatever. Uh, and that has been to some degree, probably more commonly here in South Australia in the medical area where it's commonplace to have people holding dual appointments. But in, in other areas of the public sector, less common. Um, so I think, uh, I think everyone would benefit from that interaction and uh, we'd like to find ways of trying to uh, encourage that. We have time for a couple more questions, so over here. Um, Nancy Smith, Demata Minerals. I've been really pleased to hear about all the, the how good the 90-day programs have been and the effects they've had and things like that. But I still feel there's a perception in, in the public that, and I haven't read the papers today about the extra thing about cutting public servants, there still seems a perception of, oh, that doesn't matter sort of thing, let's get rid of them. Yet, if it's a manufacturing industry or something like that, it's, oh dear, all those people, you know, losing their jobs and we need to support them. But as I say, there's this perception that it doesn't matter with public servants. That, People with families the same as all the manufacturing ones. And I know in the background we're doing things and we're, we're you know, worth it and everything like that. But I still think there's this thing in the public we're not. Now, do, do you think that by trying to, if you like, market our services a bit more or whatever, it will appear too much like spruiking and, you know, get their backs up? Or should we be trying to do more to say, look, you know, we are working in the back end to try and improve this? I think if you try and cut front, what they see as a public facing front end, yeah, they're wonderful, you can't do anything with them, but they still, mm. you know, back ends, a load of people sitting there, they're doing nothing. Yes. Look, I, I mean, I think you, you have to be in a public debate or you're going to lose. Um, and despite the fact that, um, you know, that, that you might be criticised, and, you know, we've got, you know, we've, we've got uh, essentially the uh, media outlets that, that are running campaigns against the size of the public service and they're obviously they represent powerful uh, corporate interests so you are up against that but unless you're competing in that debate then you're going to uh, community perception is going to emerge which is inaccurate and I mean we've been trying to do that ourselves but I think I mean my challenge to you as a profession is you've got to defend yourself I don't know the PSA does that but IPA as a professional organisation, I think, needs to, to enter that debate. Um, I mean, we, we did a bit of work, about two-thirds of uh, the uh, public services, frontline services, or things that most people would regard as you know, very close to frontline, whether it's a school service officer or, a, or a, um, um, somebody that's sort of quite proximate to, to frontline services. And the so-called backroom services, I mean, 
you know, the, the backroom services are the same people that, that design the and implement the regulatory processes that allows our mineral and resources projects to have a reputation for being some of the most efficient and effective regulations in, in the world. So, you know, even the back room, which everyone disparages and th says is, you know, that this is where all the waste is, I think there have been so many efficiencies there. And you're also talking about very important administrative and policy decisions as well. So we've got to defend ourselves if you want to be able to um, win these public debates. Um, and look, I mean, we can't justify, obviously, uh, over-resourcing in areas, but I think all of you are, would be familiar with the constant drive for efficiency, and it's very hard to see that, that, that there are very, it'd be very difficult to see jobs that are just, there might be lower priority programs, but it's very hard to see waste um, after all these years of efficiencies. One more question, if there is, over there. Thank you. Uh, Premier Lucas de Boer from DCSI. Uh, one of the um, suggestions in the uh, Improving the Public Sector document that you released prior to the election was around the idea of community sector reward payments. So I was just wondering if you could expand a bit on your vision for how we might work together more closely with the community services sector uh, in an environment where there's reduced funding for both. Yeah, I think we were. I think th that was the challenge type scheme. Is that what we were? T is that what you're talking about? Yes. That the. I mean, I think we were. The idea was it was a sort of a species of community engagement to try and drive this notion of participatory democracy to reward organisations in the non-government sector for coming up with ideas to try and provide that incentive. So it was much about trying to drive a different way of the public sector interacting with the non-government sector rather than a sort of a more static, here's a tender for a set of services and you respond and we'll assess it. Uh, it was trying to use our imagination a bit about how we might be able to drive new ideas in the public uh, service. Uh, we've had some great work done through Taxi, the, um, the, the initiative there to, to drive uh, innovation. Um, uh, and I think the truth is we're going to have to think about doing new things in new ways. I mean, we, in the community service area, I mean, one of the great challenges is, of course, the resources that are going into uh, essentially families that, that are getting into difficulty, uh, child protection issues. I mean, there are a lot of resources going into that area for um, uncertain returns in terms of outcomes. So. I think thinking of doing things in new ways in those areas is, is critically important. Uh, it continues to be you know, one of the fastest growing areas of our state budget, um, but uh, I think we always have to keep reflecting on doing new things in new ways in that area. I think we've actually come to the end, though, um, and I'd like to, uh, for you to join me in thanking the Premier for his speech and his vision. I'd like to also thank the very, very large crowd today for the ongoing support and for the people that talk about um, the frontline services and what we're actually doing within government. I have to say that the outreach has been quite phenomenal uh, for change at South Australia and the 90-day projects. The website has had over 15,000 hits, often from the eastern seaboard. So in fact, I think we're doing something quite unique here in South Australia, uh, but we can't continue to do that without uh, your help and the people that you work with. Um, and I actually think the public sector needs to tell its own story. And there's lots of ways of doing that besides the advertiser. Um, I think that we can actually control some of that social media ourselves. So thank you for that support. And I, uh, that's just a, a preamble to actually looking for further support as we try and actually build this to have an outreach for more than 70,000 or 100,000 public servants. I'd like to thank IPA's Pla uh, Platinum corporate sponsors, the Senior Management Council in particular, who sponsor IPA, and we've heard from the Premier today as the patron that IPA can actually be a vehicle for us to have these debates. And one of the things that IPA does want to do is make sure that the debate starts to increase around, um, I guess, the image of the public sector and what sort of things, what sort of bold ideas we can actually start to discuss um, and, and make sure that we can actually leverage that platform a lot better than we have done in the past. Uh, to PricewaterhouseCoopers and Warmans, who are also uh, Platinum Corporate sponsors, and to our gold sponsors, Flinders University and Technology One. 
And in lieu of speaker gifts, we will be donating to the Premier's charity of choice, which is the Royal Society for the Blind. And on behalf of the Premier, um, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure the Royal Society for the Blind will be very um, grateful for that. Um, as today was actually meant to be a networking event, um, it's not often we get this many people in a room from all spheres of government. We did want to actually spend a bit of time actually meeting each other. Can I throw a challenge out there that you go talk to someone that you maybe don't know? Um, because then we can actually cast the net a lot wider. So I'd like to thank you very much and uh, I'll join you out there for a cup of tea and coffee and a bit of a chat. Thank you very much.